Recently, I've been getting into 4-axis CNC machining, and I've been really enjoying it. It's incredibly satisfying and exciting. After eight years of only having a 3-axis CNC machine, it's really nice to be able to orient the part using the 4th axis and finish the entire part in basically one setup. All of this machining has been done on a hobby-grade desktop machine, and that's what this video is going to be about. Over the last two months, I've been putting the Carvera CNC machine from Make Error to the test. I don't normally do product reviews, and I think they can be quite boring, but this machine has a lot of interesting features that I think make it worth showing. Even if you have no interest in buying a machine like this, I think that it's pretty fascinating to see the current state-of-the-art hobby desktop CNC machines. And also throughout the video, I'll be making a bunch of interesting parts and little projects to test out the machine. So what is this machine and why am I so excited about it? I'm sure a lot of you have already seen similar looking hobby grade CNC machines with sleek looking designs and a nice enclosure to keep everything inside. But this specific machine has a number of really cool features that work together to massively improve the functionality and ease of use. First off, it's got a six tool tool changer with an integrated tool and sensor and a wireless touch probe that can be used for mesh bed leveling. The machine is very well constructed with all of the axes being ball screw driven on linear rails. Also the X, Y and Z axis have closed loop servo control. There's also a built-in dust extractor, support for a fourth axis add-on and also a 2.5 watt laser diode that comes standard with the machine. So you can see why when I heard about this machine I got quite excited because that's a lot of features packed into a very small, compact and clean looking machine. But the machine isn't cheap, it costs $4,800 at the moment. So I'm going to be diving in depth into all of the features of this machine to see how good it is and see whether this is potentially the right machine for you. The machine comes with some materials and some preloaded example G-code. I used these initially just to get used to the software and the setup of the machine. I quite like the clamping system on this machine. There are two 90 degree brackets that can be used to locate sheet stock to whatever work origin you're using. These brackets can be placed at two different anchor points and are located by precision dowel pins which go through the holes in the brackets, through the wasteboard and into the aluminium machine bed. There's also a decent range of clamps provided. I especially like these side clamps here which seem quite nice and very well made. Overall the clamping system seems quite robust and allows a great deal of flexibility when clamping down sheet stock. The main thing that this setup is missing is a machine vise and that will be really good for clamping more rectangular parts. The example PCB project gives me a chance to test out the mesh bed leveling of the wireless touch probe. This is a feature that's become quite common in 3D printing for bed leveling and it's really useful in CNC machining as well. The probe measures the height of the surface material through a grid of points, then it calculates and adjusts the depth of the engraving for any curvature in the material. This is great for PCB milling or engraving on large surfaces that are going to potentially not be flat because it ensures that the depth of cut of the engraving is going to be consistent across the sheet, even if it's curved. The next thing to learn how to use was the laser with an example raster image of Audrey Hepburn. 2.5 watts is not a lot of power for a laser engraver. At slow speeds it will quite easily engrave wood, but it's not going to be able to cut anything and I don't think you're going to be able to mark metal. That being said, it's still many times powerful enough to completely blind you, just with one reflection, and the enclosure isn't made from a material that absorbs laser light. Instead, there's this thin film which is supplied that you can attach yourself, but there's still quite a lot of gaps in it, and you won't find me using the laser without using also the supplied laser goggles, because I'm terrified of it. The addition of the laser diode on this machine is definitely an interesting feature, and I'm still trying to decide whether it's something I'm actually going to use, or just a nice gimmick to have. Combining the laser onto a CNC machine like this opens up some quite interesting engraving opportunities where the machine can mill out features and then they can be highlighted using the laser. And with both the milling and the laser engraving being done on the same machine, you don't have to remove the part, put it on a new machine and realign it, so in theory it should make things a bit quicker and easier. So it was time to make something of my own on this machine for the first time. I decided to start really simple by designing and building an end mill holder. This was a very simple part, basically just a block with a bunch of holes in it and some areas that I'd quite like to engrave with the laser. All of the CAD was done in Fusion 360 and I'm also going to use the Fusion 360 cam for the CNC machining. Makera have created and released a post processor for Fusion 360 for 3 axis and 4 axis machining that as soon as you use them everything works perfectly with the machine. The toolpath for this part is incredibly standard and nothing interesting at all, but what is interesting is how to program in the automatic tool changer. 
It's so easy to program in the tool changes with the post processor. All you have to do is make sure that the tool number that you want to use aligns with the tool number in the post processor. So if I have number one here, I need to make sure that this 1 8 inch end mill is in the number one slot in the machine. Then when you export your G code, the post processor automatically inserts the tool change commands into the correct place in the program where they're needed. For this machine, the tool change command is super easy. It's literally just the tool number and then M6. So when I'm going to be loading tool number one, it's T1 M6, tool number four, T4 M6, etc. I also exported an SVG of the parts which I'd like to laser engrave and imported them into Lightburn to make the laser cam. MakeArrow have also released a post processor for Lightburn, making it fully compatible with the laser module. Once you've got your G code, the next step is to upload your files to the machine. This is done using MakeArrow's own Carvera software, and overall the software seems quite good. The main issue that I have with it is that upload speeds tend to be quite slow, sometimes with larger files taking up to 5 minutes, which is quite frustrating. But the software seems to do everything that you'd expect a standard hobby CNC controller to do. It allows you to preview the G-code really nicely, you can jog the machine around, you can customise settings on the machine. Overall, it does everything that you need it to do, and I like how it displays a lot of information about the machine as you're cutting. And the software allows you to connect via USB or via Wi-Fi. And you can also use it on your phone. But I much prefer to use it just wired in on my laptop. Now it's finally time to start running some of my own G-code on this machine. I aligned the workpiece horizontal to the x-axis using the precision dowel pins and used some double stick tape to give the piece a bit more support once I've cut it out with the profile toolpath. I could then click go and it was really exciting to watch the automatic tool changer go and pick up the wireless touch probe. One feature that I really like about this probe is it has a small red laser pointer down the middle of it and you can actually get it to scan the margin of your cut and this is so useful for checking that you've got everything the right size and in the right place to check you're going to avoid any collisions. After that, the machine picks up the first tool, touches off, and is ready to cut. The stock that I'm using is some leftover beech wood, which is quite a hard wood, and with the relatively aggressive cut that I'm making, the closed loop control on the 200 watt spindle is keeping up very nicely. You can also see that the dust shoe is catching most of the chips, which is really nice. The rest of the cut went without any problems, and the tool changer worked absolutely perfectly. For me, the automatic tool changer for this machine is an absolute game changer and definitely one of the best features of the machine. In the past, I would never really bother to chamfer mill stuff because it was too much effort to manually change the tool and then manually recalibrate the length of it, just to then be slightly off and have the whole operation messed up. But the way that this machine does it automatically means chamfering parts and engraving parts and multiple operations with multiple tools is absolutely effortless. After carving I got rid of any of the leftover dust, thankfully the majority of it was actually captured by the dust extraction of the machine. Then time to move on to the laser engraving. I've got almost no experience with laser engraving so I guessed the feet and speeds and got the power a little bit too low, so I had to run it a couple of times to actually get a good engraving. Once I pull that off the machine I can load up the end mill holder with all of the end mills that I'm going to be using on it. But on closer inspection you can see that there's quite a big misalignment between the CNC engraving and the laser engraving which was kind of the whole point of doing this on the same machine, is that they should be perfectly aligned. Other than that issue, everything else looks absolutely perfect. I'm pleased with the quality of the laser engraving, and all of the machining surface finishes look great, especially the chamfer. I wanted to investigate the misalignment and see if I could correct it, so I ran a couple of tests to see how far off it was. Turns out that it was about 0.6mm misaligned in the y-axis and perfectly aligned in the x-axis. Thankfully, in the Carvera software, you can change the X and Y offset of the laser, so adding 0.6mm to the Y axis corrected this almost perfectly. And now you can see the laser is almost perfectly aligned with the engraving, as I was expecting. So now it's aligned, time to make something new, and I thought I'd make something less functional and more aesthetic this time. A while ago I came up with this mountain relief design for something for some university clothing that I was designing. I basically downloaded an STL file of some mountains and then projected some lines in the X direction, then exported those lines as vector graphics and cleaned them up in Illustrator until they looked nice. I exported the vector as a DXF and then brought it into Fusion to make a 3D model out of it. I set the CNC machining to engrave those black lines by 0.3mm into the wood and then I did the same thing in Lightburn that I did previously to then highlight all of that with the laser. The Fusion 360 toolpath was so terribly optimised, I think I need to use a different program for doing carvings like this, maybe VCOV. 
but I got the result that I wanted from the CNC milling. It was then time to see whether the laser alignment was good. Doing this longer engraving made me realize another compromise of having a laser on a CNC machine like this is that there's no proper fume extraction. Although you're not really cutting through anything, so you're not making that many fumes, if you don't have any ventilation in the room, it will really start to smell of smoke. Either way, I'm pleased with the outcome. I think that it looks quite nice how the laser engraving is sort of relieved down into the material without being too burnt. And the option of doing this all in one setup definitely opens up some interesting design opportunities, but it still remains to be seen whether this is a feature that I'll use very often. Very nice to have though. Next, I wanted to test the accuracy of this machine. I designed this kind of weird looking part with a bunch of features with known dimensions on. The machine came with a touch probe for edge finding, which I used for finding the origin of this part. I first machined the test piece from a piece of acrylic, just to test out that the toolpath all worked the way I was expecting. I forgot to include the dust shoe on this one, so it made quite a lot of mess. The carving came out nicely on the very soft acrylic, so I wanted to also then do the same thing in aluminium, and then compare the dimensions between the two, and see if there's any difference. Using single flute end mills on this machine, it's very easy to mill aluminium. This was literally just a first guess with the feeds and speeds using 500 millimeters a minute and 10,000 RPM spindle speed. And it seems to be working really nicely. I'm sure that I could dial this in and optimize it better for a better surface finish. You can see that on the internal bores here, the machine is struggling slightly with recutting chips, and it would really help if I used the air blast coolant, which is an option on this machine, but I don't have an air compressor yet, so I haven't set that up. Then for the finishing, I changed to a two flue end mill, which I was hoping would leave a good surface finish, but I kept the feet and speeds exactly the same. This finishing pass seemed to work pretty well and leave a nice finish on the external surface. Using the same feed rate and RPM as the single flute end mill turned out not to be a good idea and I ended up destroying the end mill as it gummed up with the chips. And I think that's because the chip load was too low because I kept the RPM the same for the two flute end mill as the one flute end mill. I changed back to the single flute end mill to finish the rest of the part, which definitely doesn't leave the best surface finish, but at least it didn't break. And then everything was finished off with another nice chamfer, which was very satisfying to watch. So the surface finish on the aluminium part seems pretty decent. I think that the floor finish would have been improved greatly if I take a smaller depth of cut for the last pass with the adaptive clearing. There's definitely a lot of room for improvement and optimization of feeds and speeds. So more importantly, let's compare some dimensions. Considering I designed this part, I could have made it way easier to measure. It's actually a pretty rubbish design. The external dimensions were all fantastic. Everything was in about 0.05 millimeters, which is great. Also, there didn't seem to be any significant difference between the softer plastic and the harder aluminum part, proving that the rigid linear guide block and ball screw assembly is working really well for the accuracy of this machine. Interestingly, when I was measuring the internal features, everything seemed to be about 0.1 millimeter undersized. I think this might have been due to recutting chips and not having the best finishing operations on the inside bores. Perhaps running the operations again to get a spring pass on the material would have helped, and also I'm sure that the air blast when I use it is also going to help. But this is something that I need to improve on in the future. This machine is really capable for milling aluminium though, and I'm sure with a bit more optimization I can further improve the surface finish. Macro photos always make surface finish of machine stuff look terrible. Okay, that's enough messing around. It's now time to finally get onto the most exciting bit, the four axis machining. This is the fourth axis add-on and it's an optional paid add-on for this machine. It's got a nice little self-centering four jaw chuck and an adjustable tailstock. The axis is rotated by a NEMA 17 stepper motor connected with a large belt reduction to the spindle. The motor's powered through a 4-pin connector on the side of the bed here, and initially I was a little bit worried that it would come loose during machining, but I've used it loads and it's had absolutely no problems so far. 
One thing that is worth doing if you pick up one of these is taking it apart and deburring all of the sharp edges on the inside of the chuck jaws and the chuck itself. This just means that it will run much more freely. This is a pretty standard thing that you have to do with pretty much any new chuck that you buy anyway. I wanted to jump right in with making my own projects on the fourth axis. So I went onto Thingiverse and I tried to find a model that I'd want to make. I think the Phase 1 Clone Trooper helmets are by far the coolest Clone Trooper helmets, so I wanted to make a small keyring version of that. I found this model that looks pretty good and I'll put a link in the description down below to it. I imported it into Fusion 360 and then set about trying to learn how to make some 4th axis cam in Fusion. There was a fair bit of trial and error but in the end it wasn't that much harder than 3 axis machining. The biggest challenge was thinking about how to hold the part and which bits to machine away and which bits to leave so that the part would still be solid. Also the order of operations was quite important to think about as well. The actual 4th axis stuff in Fusion was very easy. I just had to use the tool orientation setting to flip around the part when I wanted to move it and index it for the roughing. And then for the finishing, I used a rotary parallel toolpath with a 30 degree V bit. Unfortunately, the rotary parallel finishing toolpath used to be free and now you have to pay for it in Fusion 360, which is a massive shame. Thankfully, I'm still a student, so I get free educational access, but it's a big shame that that feature is not free anymore. I wanted to make this clone trooper helmet out of aluminium and I wasn't sure how the fourth axis add-on would hold up. Even with the belt reduction, the NEMA 17 stepper motor doesn't have that much torque and I can quite easily stall out with my hand. But I think because these parts are quite small, the amount of torque applied into the chuck when you're cutting them out, even when roughing, isn't that high. So this was actually never really a problem. Even when taking some relatively heavy cuts, the fourth axis seemed really solid and I wasn't expecting it to be as good as this. I'm not sure if this 30 degree V bit is the best for getting a good finish on aluminium or for this type of part, but it definitely let me get a lot of detail. Perhaps a bullnose end mill would have been better. It was really nice to go from a piece of round stock to the finished part being held on by only two little tabs, all in one operation without me having to touch the part. There was very minimal cleanup required after the fact, and I was pretty happy with the results. Again, the surface finish looks a lot worse on camera than it does in real life, and I'm definitely not using optimal feeds and speeds or tooling at the moment for this sort of operation. On top of that, I think some sort of lubrication or the air blast would also help. I wanted to optimize the machining of this part a little bit. I realized that it was long enough that I didn't actually need any tailstock support. And even with no tailstock support, with a sharp single flue end mill, I'm able to use some quite aggressive feeds and speeds. I think the 4th axis add-on combined with the automatic tool changer gives you an incredible amount of automation on this machine. The fact that you can go from raw stock to a completely finished part hanging off by one tab is just amazing to me. I don't think that there's another hobby machine on the market that out the box has this level of automation. At the sacrifice of a little bit of surface finish on the finishing pass, I was able to get the cycle time down to only 1.5 hours per one of these parts, which is pretty quick I think, for the amount of detail. I ended up making a few of these to give out to some of my friends who were graduating university this year. So maybe they won't forget me when they're off doing much more exciting things. So if you ever see someone with one of these on their key rings, you'll know that they're officially my friend. I then wanted to make one for myself and being a little bit selfish, I decided I'd make my one out of a slightly nicer material. So I got a piece of brass round stock. And the brass machines so nicely on this machine and it also looks so much more aesthetic with all of the golden chips flying off. And that's where I got some of the really nice looking slow motion videos from the intro of this video. I think the surface finish on the brass came out great and it's a lot nicer than the aluminium. Now I'm going to give you a little bit more information about Make Hair of the Company, about this machine and what I'm going to be using the machine for, while in the background making another gift on the 4th axis. This machine started off as a Kickstarter campaign where they managed to raise $1.7 million. Unlike a lot of other Kickstarters, Makera have been successful in fulfilling all of their pre-orders on Kickstarter and all of their backers have now received the machine. And this product's actually now available for purchase on their website with a two-week lead time. 
On top of that, they've built up a really nice active community of users who are enthusiastic and passionate about the product. And there's also so much product support available from developers on their Discord server and on their Facebook group. It's really nice to see a company that are very passionate about the product that they've made and are doing a lot to support users. Overall, from what I've seen, everyone seems to be very satisfied with both the product and the customer support that they've got from MakeHera. Including me, I've been really pleasantly surprised by the machine. I've been blown away by the amount of automation, how much time it saves and how much more enjoyable it makes the process of making stuff on this machine. The fact that I'm now making stuff out of my bedroom at university means that I can't just be using big, really noisy and really messy machines as often. The fact that this machine is fully enclosed, very quiet and very clean, hoovering up a lot of the dust itself, just means that it makes my bedroom so much more of a livable environment compared to when I'm using my homemade machine. Don't get me wrong, I am still going to be using my homemade machine a lot, but when it comes to making small projects really quick, I think this machine is a lot more enjoyable to use and it's going to mean that I get to do more projects more often and hopefully create more videos. If you hadn't already guessed what this project was, it's a nice little brass sunflower necklace. I really like the way that it came out. This was made as an apology gift for spending too much time on the CNC. When I'm spending too much time on the machine, I end up spending even more time on the machine. And in the end, I think she was very happy with the necklace. I hope you found this video interesting. And even if you're not interested in purchasing a machine, I hope that you enjoyed some of the projects I was making on it. If you are interested in purchasing a Carvera machine, I've got a link in the description down below. And purchasing through this link will give me a small kickback and help support this channel and the projects that I do on it. So thank you very much for watching this far if you're still here, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.